we often find ourselves buying and selling in Ghana. Is that the only investment we can do in our country? What are the opportunities? What practical steps are we taking to facilitate the travel arrangements of those seeking to attend the summit in Ghana? Being born here and our parents instilling in us our pride of being Ghanaian, I've realized that when I was watching the clip, I was actually saddened. And somebody said, why were you sad? I was sad because our children don't get to experience. Because I'm looking here, and my children are second generation. And what you guys are proposing, my kids don't see that. On the first question about why is it that we are, most Ghanaians are engaged in buying and selling, it's part of the economy. Once the economy is growing, you will see a chunk of people in the buying and selling industry. But once the economy grows, and we diversify the economy, I remember during the time of H, when he was the Minister of Trade, we had a program called Graduating Trade Barons into Captains of Industries. The Ghana Union Traders Association, through the Ministry of Trade, we found out that most of them were into buying and selling. And we said, how can you how can we migrate you from just buying and selling into captains of industry? So these are some of the things that are ongoing. Some people have been buying the things from China and other places to do the distribution. But now they are doing their own manufacturing in Ghana. But if you don't have Ghanaians doing this business, it also opens doors for outsiders. Now you can see that in most parts of the country you have other people from West Africa, I don't want to mention names, even Chinese are doing things that Ghanaian are supposed to do. So the buying and selling are core to our economic development. <laughs> Let me jump to Madam. What you are saying is good, and that's why we're saying that we are all here to interact. Off the cuff, there's somebody that I can recommend to you who is targeting the second generation. That is Arnold Safan Kantanka, Mifri Ghana. He does so many programs. And in fact, what he has been able to achieve is to take them to Ghana as part of volunteerism and other things. So I can link you up with him, and then you can do it. Our customer service is working. And normally, normally, I can assure you, sometimes when people talk about your call and people are not picking it, you can imagine the number of Ghanaians in UK and everybody trying to get in at the same time. But the fact is, depending on specifically what you want to do, if it is about the diaspora going home, you call the main reception. They will direct you to the diaspora office, and Joyce is in charge, that you know very well. If it is about welfare and consular, they have their numbers. So please, just be specific. Look for the right uh, number or the people you want to call, and then we can make it uh, available to you. On the other hand, since you are the chair of the, uh, what do you call, the Ghana uh, Union uh, Council, we also want to use you to also propagate some of the good things that the mission and then others are doing to make sure that people can go to Ghana. And then Mr. Chairman and other people also add. I remember at the last um, diaspora homecoming, the minister was able to also mention that um, they're seriously looking at the customer service to make it a priority area to really orientate or to take you know the, the people involved through the necessary orientation to improve on the customer service so some of these things are some of the things that we keep saying that it's in the pipeline it's all being delivered it will soon get matured and you all see the benefit of it let's be very honest there's been remarkable improvement as far as services offered by the ghana High commission is concerned in respect of the digitization of some of the things that they do Basically, that has improved on how some things are done in the first place. And uh, I think, um, yes, there's always room for improvement. And on that basis, I believe they would also be willing to take a look at it, you know, going forward. I think um, 
on that same sort of principle of never giving up as far as you know the issues are concerned this is the same principle upon which we are urging you to also then you know follow through to the diaspora homecoming um, summit and never give up so that i will be on the front banner all the time i think in, i'm so excited that um, this lady has also contributed and asked something and how get finding out how they can get involved particularly excited because like she identified herself she is the ndc women's organizer isn't it chairperson oh sorry matua <laughs> homaso no, but I'm honestly happy and excited by that sort of um, inclusion because that is essentially what the Diaspora Affairs Office of the President is trying to do, that we are encouraging everyone to get involved. The Diaspora, if I should let you know, is something that we would have to consider as a tribe. Ghana being a tribal country, the Diaspora, because we have come to live out here, we have that thing common among us. That is, we have formed a tribe outside of Ghana. So as a tribe, we have common issues. We have common agenda. We have common things that we are fighting for. And that should be irrespective of party colors. And I'm so excited that she's found time to come here. And she's looking to see how the children can get involved. Like the gentleman already replied, Mifri Ghana and his um, afford organization are doing marvelously. I think this week, they have been doing something already in Ghana that is essentially to address some of the key issues you know, that um, we are talking about. Every time I've come here, I've had the opportunity of meeting a Ford guy, which is um, um, Alfred uh, Safo. And that is a very, very young man who is looking. I also mentioned that that Mifri Ghana t-shirt was started during the 2000 you know, uh, World Cup was basically his idea. And he's a very, very progressive guy. We are working closely with him. That's another thing that I need to mention, that they, we have various associations, organizations that are working through the Diaspora Affairs Office. We had to get through to the Foreign Affairs, for instance, to secure the parliament for their you know, conference to, to take place. And these are some of the working relationships that we are putting in place to facilitate whatever you come home to do in the diaspora. The organizations are all lined up. I think there are others as well. They are all trying to get the children interested in some of the things that we're doing. I was talking earlier to the HE and I was referring to the kids party. Now that's how best I can refer to it. On the mountains at the Brie in December. I can tell you, if you are if your ward or child has not been involved, tell them to come home that Christmas because almost everybody was there last one. I made a mistake of going to drop my kids out there and I couldn't turn my car around because there are so many people you cannot even move back. And the Akrakofodia Road gets blocked. All mostly by kids who have come from, you know, here, America, all over the world. The kids are telling you. I'm telling you already on the match, we can stop them and we have to encourage them and we have to nurture and direct them and really make use of what they are capable of. The only problem I had, because I've just recently come back from Ghana, it's the quality of the beaches, particularly in Accra and the sea itself. Um, you know, do we have any plans to actually clean it up? You've highlighted that um, the diaspora, the Ghana's diaspora has an important role to play towards Ghana's um, development, economy, etc., etc. And I was just wondering, given that the, your current office sits within the president's um, office, whether that is really sustainable, because it might seem like a political appointment, and uh, whether it's worth aligning that within the Ministry of Tourism, uh, sorry, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, which some countries do, and Sierra Leone is looking to do that as well as best practice. My second question is around the diaspora's, uh, Ghana, Ghana diaspora's um, role in terms of um, investment and job creation. I just wondered if uh, there is any system in place to capture data around that so that you see how that is shaping. We have a tourism sanitation project that sits under the Ministry of Tourism. And there are two things that the Tourism Sanitation Project is looking to do. We constructed more facilities, washrooms across some of the beaches to ensure that um, people have decent washrooms that they can go to and not want to have the fresh air as it is. Number two, 
these beaches mostly are either privately owned or the assemblies are the ones who control them. And so we have uh, sponsored a legislative instrument which is currently at a very final stage. And that legislative instrument is to bring all tourist sites and attractions under the regulation of the Ghana Tourism Authority. And it's a very simple thing because when, whether it's a museum, whether it's a park, there are different organizations um, managing it. And so sometimes you go in and you don't have the backing of the law. There's that realization across the world that you know the diaspora, not just for Ghana, but for every other country, needs to be mobilized, that there needs to be some kind of institution. Ghana is not just starting something, but we are looking at how that can be a transformational sort of um, engine for the diaspora's contribution. We have on our drawing boards the idea, for instance, of the Diaspora Commission, of the Diaspora Council, of the Diaspora, you know, et cetera, et cetera. There are institutions that we are looking to compare notes with what the, they are doing in their own country. Nigeria has got the Diaspora Commission, for one, that sits at the presidency, that has been able to issue diaspora bonds, et cetera, et cetera. When you go to Senegal, they have another institution. We are even looking at the possibility, and most of you are not even aware, or it doesn't immediately draw on you, that there used to be a diaspora ministry. When Jake was the Minister for Tourism, he wasn't just the Minister for Tourism. He was Minister for Tourism and Diaspora Affairs. So he used to be there at that level. And these are the processes that we have to go through as and when it becomes more and more definite, I mean, as to where we, it should all sit and where it should all be, it will become clearer. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs is in charge of diaspora activities. But for the president and the government in power, they believe that they have to give impetus to all that the AU is doing. That's why that office has been created, to push, and then to make sure that they, he leverages on the work of the diaspora. So for sustainability, I can assure you, it is already there at the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. And my colleague is here. Uh, Joyce, can you stand up so that they can see you? You are, you are in charge of diaspora. And, and, and in other jurisdictions, if you go to other embassies, high commissions, you also see um, my colleague from Foreign Affairs in charge of the diaspora. So for us as a country, it's core and it's a mandate from the AU Agenda 2063. Thank you. You know, Stephen Lawrence Association, they have um, an association that mentors the children. And you know how Ghanaian children are. They are so um, respectful that one of the tutors there introduced him to go to Stephen Lawrence Association to get a mentor. I'm only suggesting to the High Commissioner that if we can have something like that, that even the student doctor can come and have a mentor and also the architect will come and have a mentor. And if they can be met once or twice in a year, so that they also know that Ghanaians, we have people like that to back them whatever they need. What is the current government doing to make it easier for the people in the diaspora to acquire their, uh, the land and property in Ghana, which is most the, of the biggest investment, most of the individuals from the diaspora doing Ghana. And also, um, uh, just a suggestion or addition to what um, Nana Shurima was saying. I think that when we're going to Ghana, we need to do the planning and uh, contact the necessary uh, dignitaries or officers who can help us and our children when we arrive in Ghana to go to the right places, not just to be going and visiting families and going to bed. I'm the CEO and founder of an organization called Everything's Education. So for me, any, any school in the UK, any university in the UK that wants to in, increase their diversity and have more Ghanaians, they come and they speak to me. So within that boarding school community, within the um, university, the Russell Group, the Ivy League, if they want to know about anything concerning Ghanaians, they come and speak to me. So. When parents say that they, they don't know anything or there's nothing that's happening, it's because they haven't been given the right information. So if anybody wants to speak to me afterwards, I can help them with that. There are so many scholarships out there for our people. In particular, they want to do more business with Ghanaians than they want to do with Nigerians just because they see Ghana as being an emerging market. 
And so, um, so many schools at the moment, even for September entry, are offering 50% off scholarships, 100% off, and the problem is Ghanaians don't know about these things, but no. I do know about it. So I run an event where I take... You, you, you are a godsend. <laughs> and you know what? The Minister Council for Information is just next to you. <laughs> so do that connection there right now. Nana mentioned mentoring of doctors and professionals um, and architects, yes. We've got a young architect outside, um, but, you know, he provides those facilities as well. I, as a lawyer, for many, many, many years, have mentored Ghanaians who've gone on to qualify as lawyers as well. The problem we have in our community is that you go to churches and you tell them that if your child wants to read law or wants to have a feel about law, you know, they should come to our practice and we'll take them on for about a week or two. And on vacation, they send them to go and work in Sainsbury's um, because they feel that, you know, that's more profitable um, for the child to and to subsidize the family's income. And that is, uh, but that is very, very discouraging. Uh, as somebody who, you know, has brought up a lot of Ghanaians in the legal field. And for me, it's some of the things that really doesn't help our community. And that is why I believe that it's rather the parents who ought to input in their children the culture of, you know, working ethics early, placing them with um, law practices or medical practices. There are a lot of Ghanaians dentists in this country. Some of the best dentists here are Ghanaians and even doctors as well. And to find them is very, very easy. So I don't think it's a huge problem. I think it may be that the parents haven't looked enough. Now, somebody raised an issue about land acquisition. I, I, I said it's because I've made it my business to make sure that it, it, you know, it works for people. There's an organization here called the On Point. That is your role. They make sure that, that your land acquisition is problem free, you know, um, from sourcing legal, um, lawful land, you know, the duration, because it's not many people who can buy freehold land or even a hundred years um, leasehold in Ghana, especially if you don't have a Ghanaian passport. So there are organizations here who are able to help with land acquisition in Ghana. You also raised some concerns about the, 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 the security for some kids when they come to Ghana and how the parents can cocoon them and make sure that they stay only in there and not. I suppose um, perhaps, you know, again, rather an individual thing here. But on the whole, if you compare the kind of freedom or the security that, you know, kids have in Ghana and here, I would say it's perhaps it's even worse here. Than, and it's better in Ghana. I, when I lived here, I wouldn't let my son go out. Seriously, of all the nice killings and all the shootings that goes on here, me and my son go out to West End, I'll come and pick you up myself. But let my son come to Ghana. I don't even know what time he goes out and what time he's coming in. He, 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 it's like the whole country is for him. He does what, you know, so it's, it's very easier to enjoy that kind of freedom in Ghana than, than you know, perhaps here. And perhaps that is not a very fair, um, whatever, uh, view of or assessment of the situation as far as Ghana is concerned. And then, Hajia, you mentioned that uh, issue about the land, that we, we have to do something about it. Personally, I am of the opinion that you do not go forward just looking for solutions for people in the diaspora. If you take our office as being responsible for a constituency of the diaspora, if you take that of another constituency, and that is that MP in Parliament, he wouldn't go into, say, looking for specific land issues like that with, you know, for his constituency. The problem is that something needs to be addressed across the board in Ghana. That digitization of the land, you know, registration and the land reforms that the government is undertaking is a long shot at, you know, dealing with that issue. The management of land administration is a key thing that the office of the president is taking seriously. That we believe when the measures that are in place, uh, are, I mean, that we are looking to put in place are in place, will go a long way to address the concerns of people, not just in the diaspora, but across the country. So that is, there lies a solution of some sort.
In 2017, when we had the summit, I think there were about three thematic areas that we sought to address. And in order to give the summit, I think you mentioned about what has been achieved. In order to give a, a bit of credi credibility to what we are trying to achieve, um, have you uh, thought about giving a report on those areas? Um, if I can remember, one of the clear areas that we were looking at was um, diaspora finance and investment, which we had a finance minister and trade minister and all those addressing. My grandfather is Niamon Kote. He was the designer of the Ghana coat of arms. So I wear Ghana with pride. Um, and I'm part of a generation that feels slightly disconnected. Um, so my profession is I'm an anesthetic nurse and I actually used to work across the road here. And I want to know what can you do for me who's now left the NHS, left that profession and is now an educator? How can I impact Ghana in regards to their health and their services? I was saying that there's a big emphasis on investment and I am looking at how much of it would concentrate on business startups and business models. There are going to be reports, no, no one report, reports and all the thematic areas that you've mentioned. Also, we've got things for all the days. Day one, well, for example, is welcome home, a fully engaged diaspora. Day two is preparing Ghana as an investment hub, opportunities for the diaspora. And day three is Ghana today, what it takes to come back. So we've got things for all the days and um, there will be reports for all the areas because our constituents expect us to report back to them. The reality as far as the ROPA is concerned is that this is something that very much sits in the courts of the, what do you call it, the electoral commissioner. The electoral commissioner needs to be resourced to do it. That is what they are working on to make sure that they can do. Again, there's other arms of government that are also to play a part, and that is part of what they are waiting to do. Like the parliament of Ghana, the, 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 the parliament is waiting for some acts to be allies, to be established, to be taken into them, to see how they can contribute to it. So yeah, there are still some mileage to go, and uh, we are very much in touch with the electoral commissioner as far as that is giving us them. They've been giving us every assurances, and we know, you know, it is going to. I don't want to sit here and tell you we are going to vote in 2020 or not vote in 2020. This is not just a single person's decision to to come out and say, but it is a collaborative thing, an issue that is going to be resolved sooner or later. And then, as far as mobilization of the diaspora is concerned, I suppose you know everything that we've been talking about here is an indication of what we are doing to mobilize. And uh, the appointment of the, the youth ambassador, the youth, you know, the, the engagement of the youth in all aspects of the, the, what do you call it, nation building, how they can be assisted to come and do all sorts of things. It's also an indication of the mobilization. Most importantly, this organization of the homecoming exercise, in maintaining this committee and establishing the committee across other countries, to make sure that they can function as well as this one is an indication of what we are going to be doing, mobilizing the people and you know engaging them at all levels. The British High Commission is engaging us and all the embassies are responding to our initiatives. For instance, in UK, they have just agreed that even the consultation that we are coming to do, the High Commission is going to be helping. They are going to also provide certain facilities. In addition, they have appointed an equivalent of a diaspora person at the British High Commission who is liaising with the office to enable us to achieve so many things that we have set about to do. And now we are also in a position to look at the template of countries to tell other countries to say that this is how they are assisting our people in their host country. Can you also do something similar? Because of that sort of engagement, which basically is a template from the GIZ in Germany. The German government is assisting people from Germany who are looking to relocate or to not just even relocate, but to do business in Ghana. So for instance, if you are in Germany, you want to start a job in Ghana and your pay is not adequate, 
the GIZ initiative will enable them to send you to Ghana. I mean, pick any job that you 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 think is not good enough, but it's in terms of salary, they would then add some percentage to it to enable you to have a soft landing before you know anything happens to you in Ghana. Yes, I think on the startup initiative, there are so many initiatives in Ghana right now. This is being headed by the Business Development Authority. The Business Development Authority has you know various initiatives that really is putting money in the in the hands of certain people, even the Kayais and uh, some people. But as far as the diaspora is concerned, there are private initiatives that are coming through, working with their office to see how they can also assist in that direction. These are four initiatives. This is recent, um, this um, ongoing um, meeting in Ghana is one of such initiatives that is looking to see how they can uh, get the people in the diaspora to also get that entrepreneurial experiences that they are looking for in order to be able to be attractive to Ghana. Yeah. When we're talking about tourism, sometimes we downplay what it can do for the country. And we focus more on the oil and gas and the gold and all that. I just want to share some statistics with you. This is an industry that directly employs 350,000 Ghanaians. On an average, on an average, every visitor to Ghana spends about 1,800 and sixty-two dollars. And so when they come in, whether it's a hotel, whether it's a restaurant, whether it's a taxi driver, whether it's a seamstress, a dressmaker, a hairdresser, whatever it is, the value chain in itself provides so much for the country. And it's also an industry that you don't necessarily need a PhD to be employed in. So from the cleaners, the housekeepers, to everybody finds a role to play in there. And for those who said they are looking for where there are opportunities, tourism and hospitality is that one place. Because Ghana has been blessed. We have so many sites and attractions. So whether it's a small guest house you want to get into, for those of you who have uh, gone into real estate and you don't know what to do with your big mansions in Ghana, convert them into a guest house. It will generate some revenue for you. You will employ people and you will get some return. Please, do not ignore the Ghanaian media, the Ghanaian journalists who are busy. There's a lot we can do. I hear everyone talking about the diaspora, but until this gentleman spoke, it did not seem like it included the descendants of the African slaves. At present, Ghana is, is claiming 777 trillion for slavery, and it does not include the descendants of the African slaves outside, who you can see is being abused on the streets, murdered, and, and so on, so that do need to be taken. Those things need to be taken into consideration. And if we don't buy to sell to our own, there's a middleman that's doing it. And that's what we need to cut out, the middleman, that we can do business ourselves. Also, with situations here, I am I'm British Council of Warden where I am. I am the British and Commonwealth Council at Warden where I am. So maybe what Ghana needs to do is have some council at wardens in the community that the community can call when they have a problem. Sponsored students to the UK, I'm sure other places in the world, do enjoy the you know privilege of voting. They exercise their franchise, no matter where they are in the world. So we are citizens. We are also citizens. We have not renounced our citizenship as Ghanaians. I'm talking about Europa, you know, coming back to that. Yes. I know it's been a struggle. I don't know what, why, you know, as yes, we are talking, so it's not fair on him. Could be allowed the privilege because Thank we have you. students, travels, maybe double styles here in the UK. They can vote. I cannot vote. Why is that? We realize that in our Ghanaian community, there is no middle grounds between GP and the mental health services. We have been able to establish a foundation and then the foundation on Sunday, next week Sunday, will be signing an MOU with Ghana Mental Health Authorities, South London and Mosley NHS Foundation Trust, and, and Royal College of Psychiatrists.
So that is what we have got in place coming up on Sunday. Now, we have dedicated ourselves that every first Sunday and third Sunday of the month, we support Ghanaians with mental health issues or emotional issues. We've got a support group in Hackney and we've got one in South London. The question is, how is the Ghana High Commission um, and the team going to support us to render these services to Ghana? And another issue that we find quite frustrating is, we've got a Scottish consultant and other consultants as well from New Zealand who comes with us to Ghana to improve, working closely with Konfanochi Hospital, which the Otunfo himself has now embraced the project. And we're looking to build the first mental health um, recovery hospital in Kumasi. And this is coming up very soon. We are going to Ghana in October with the consultants. But the frustration is when we go to Ghana, we don't get the help. Everything is financed from our pockets. We need that support. The last time we went to Ghana, in fact, everywhere we went with the English people who have dedicated themselves to support Ghana, they have to pay money from their pockets. Even the media, they have to pay. And it was quite frustrating for me to ask this a consultant to earn 300 pounds an hour, dedicated two weeks of his time to help our country for him to pay for his accommodation. It's very sad. But this October, we here have put money together to make sure that they receive the comfort. The clearance of products made by Ghanaians, for example, the FDA, etc., etc., seems to always be a challenge when it comes to import and export. Um, so a lot of our products are getting caught in between the cracks and aren't getting to market. Um, I've reached out and had many meetings with Mr. Adder, but I wanted to throw it out there. A, for people who have products that they want to sell to me to contact us, the website is gloryroots.com, but then B, how do companies such as my own twin up with the Ghana High Commission or the British um, High Commission who are also helping us to move forward to address the challenges in clearance of the products? Um, other quick question is, um, I have a dual citizenship card, um, which I was advised to get. I have a British passport first, um, then I got a dual citizenship card. Then I was told to get a Ghanaian passport because it would be better. Now, when I get to Ghana, my question is, is there a better option to provide? As in, is it better for me to use the dual citizenship card with the British passport, or is it better to use the Ghanaian passport? I want to know what key inclusive approaches are being adopted to attract and encourage our people from the diaspora, bearing in mind there are two types. There are first generation, but there are also second, third and fourth generation. Particularly the young youths who are being disaffected, particularly the male youths, disaffected, disillusioned and criminalized. Marginalized is a big problem in this country. And when we talk about education, that's also the same in higher education. Very few get to higher education. They're very bright. And if it wasn't for people like me and my intervention, they wouldn't have graduated. So I want to know, and they are talking about going back, but where are we going to go back? Who's going to take us in? What guarantees are there for us? So that's what I want to know. You may recall that when His Excellency was speaking, he said something that is something that has always been on his heart, that we have counselors, that we have uh, people who will give advice. But we realize that here yeah, people are going through a lot. Yes. And at the mission, we cannot cover all areas at a time. So when we have people at various uh, um, areas, it helps us. We work together. So your work actually complements what we do at the mission. So first of all, let me say that uh, when it comes to what, how can the mission help you, we look at each, we, we consider issues based on their peculiar nature. So we we'll have to sit down with you and know what we intend to offer and what your approach would be and who are your target group and all that. We look at all these things, then we now look at, do we have to work in contact with Ghanaian dominated churches? Or do we need traditional leaders? Who, do we need youth groups, depending on your motive and your intentions and what you hope to achieve? But let me say that it's a good thing. So please, my, my office is always open. My boss is always there for you. Anytime you can, H has always had that open door for such uh, policies. Only last week, the High Commissioner, the Deputy High Commissioner, we were all <laughs> in some of the markets in London to see some of the things that are going on. We are trying to make sure that 
we collate all this information. Because the information that is coming out from the importers is another thing. We are also talking to DEFRA, the Department for Food and Rural Department, the Standard Authority, and all the authorities in UK. You'll be amazed. Some of the results that they are also bringing to us is different from what you are also telling us. So we want to make sure that we collate all the information and then we do the right thing. But let me say this. International trade has become so competitive that for you to compete anywhere, you have to make sure that, I'm sure when you brought some of the items, you could see that standard requirements, they are not there. You cannot trade in any product that you don't have all the products, what is because of allergies and other things. And these are basic things. You cannot use these products for UK, US, and other markets. It can be traded in, in Ghana and other places. But once it crosses its border, you are in big trouble. So that is what the Ghana Standard Board is trying to do. Especially for this, uh, what we call SMEs, to also know that they are not producing just for the local market, but they are also producing for the international market. And another vein, we are also asking the, all the shopkeepers, shop owners, businesses to come together so that we can form an association. We have been talking to people about this, but I don't know, typical of Ghanaians, somebody is doing something, he doesn't want somebody to know. Somebody gets an opportunity that brings 20 footer container of yam. He cannot bring it. You would prefer to do it with a Lebanese or an Indian, not a Ghanaian. You cannot prosper as a nation if you continue to do this. So you as business people, you have to help us. As I'm saying right now, we have gotten some responses from DEFRA and other things. We will meet you and then we will look at it on specific products. In the case of Affair, is that right? Affair wants to make sure that he can also get some red carpet treatment when he comes to Ghana. I think we're going to do all our best to make sure that our own is also recognized and appreciated. I think uh, part of this whole idea of year of return um, is basically to enable us to also tell our own story. So we are urging and encouraging our own African you know, journalists and people in the media to take some of the initiatives. And lots of people have been making their way towards, I mean, coming to the office. I think notably in the UK here, there's um, this um, lady, Eva Simpson. I think most of you will know her. Um, my understanding is that she's a high profile uh, uh, in, the, in the media world. She's found time to come over. We've had some discussions. They are all looking to see how they can, you know, write things from their own, you know, their, their, from our own um, perspective. And that's what we are also encouraging them to do. Um, again, there was an African briefing editorial policy. I think, yeah, yeah, that's, that's a fair, isn't it? Yeah, uh -huh. so that's, that's also been uh, mentioned. And then I think um, Prof also mentioned, the last one was uh, in respect of the key thing that we are, you know, gathered here, which is why should you come back? And that issue is something that we continuously, uh, you know, look to address. From my, from my personal point of view, you don't even need to pose that question because you should take it for granted that you should go back anyway. Because this is no place for you. With all the Trumpism and all the things that is happening, with all the, you know, the, the things that is happening in that world outside, we have a place where we can call home. And you don't need an invite to come home in the first place. Of course, there's always that issue as to, do I go and settle? Do I live here? Do I live here? That certainly is an individual decision. But what I can say is that this in my, as I see it, it's a small world. It's a global village. We are not saying that everybody should pack bag and baggage and come and leave home. But you have the opportunity to look back. To look back, not just with, you know, looking, but in terms of contributing some ideas that you can push to enable things to happen in a place where we can call the homeland and be proud of and to be able to beat our chest and let people know that we also have a place so that when we get the types of trump and others talking as if you know some of us do not have a place we let them know that we also have a beautiful place and we are happy to live there